we should be good to go. All right, we'll call the meeting to order uh, and I'll recognize that myself and council member Fleming are here to establish a quorum. Uh, Mayor Rogers is not able to join today. We'll go to public comment for non-agenda items. If there's anybody who has a comment on something that falls within the jurisdiction of our subcommittee, but isn't on today's agenda, happy to hear from you. Anyone? Do we have anybody online? We have no hands raised on Zoom. All right, then and we'll start with department reports. Chair Rogers, yes. may I ask if we could um, do the approval of minutes, please? Oh, did I, I completely two. skip over them? I did. Bottom of the face sheet. Yep. Thank you. Did you have any amendments to the minutes? Aye. Okay. Uh, let's do public comment. Anybody have any changes to the minutes? Any hands on Zoom? No hands on Zoom. Great. We'll show those approved as presented without objection. And now we'll go to Tasha for the department reports. And I do not have any department reports this time. All right. You want to just jump on in on item 5.1 then? You got it. Okay. So item 5.1, downtown parking study presented by Chad Hedge, manager of the parking division. Just park yourself right over there. <laughs> oh, we're started already. I need to write that one down. That was a good one. That was good. Okay. Sure and I support to sure. sure. do that for you if you want me to. Uh, that's okay. It'd be parallel. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, sure. Michelle, yeah. within the lines. That, that's coming up. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a meter joke you could throw in there right. somewhere. Oh, I'm sure there. We could, we're trying to figure this out. Sure. You can keep... <laughs> more, there's more. Oh, don't invite me. <laughs> Bring the, the expert in. For me, it's operator error. It's not the IT. Yeah. Probably easier to go for that one. Go. All right. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We're uh, my name's Chad Edge. I'm the parking division manager. This is Tanya. She is our, our new analyst. Uh, um, and we were brought here today to talk about the, the climate action subcommittee uh, or the downtown parking study that we got a, the funds we got awarded through the MTC. I think you were on the, the, the board. Um, kind of talk about what we're going to use these funds for uh, and how it's going to help uh, the, the downtown, the railroad square, how it's going to impact parking. And, and, um, and so I threw a whole bunch of extra information into these slides just so I can make sure I cover it all. But uh, on Jan June 28th, uh, the, the MTC approved the Plan Bay Area 2050 implementation of the grant award. Uh, the city of Santa Rosa uh, city of, or parking will receive $207,000 uh, that'll go towards a curb management and access plan grant. Um, that study will include, uh, will evaluate our existing occupancy. We will utilize and compare best practices from local agencies. Uh, we're going to look at San Diego, San Rafael, I mean, Northern California, Southern California, figure out ways we can make our plan work going forward. Uh, evaluate future demand impacts from um, the state's elimination of the parking minimums uh, and approving the approval of multiple housing developments in the downtown and, and railroad square area. Uh, we're going to establish goals and visions for the future of the downtown of railroad square, analyze current revenues with future needs. Uh, uh, importantly, evaluate the EV capacity and needs with the increase in, in multifamily developments, how, how what we do in the garages and the lots are going to affect uh, these developments in the downtown uh, impacts on the grid and then uh, the infrastructure availability through uh, numerous meetings with pg and &E. uh, we're going to develop numerous presentations that we can outline the progress as we go forward and, and answer questions and have, have multiple uh, community meetings to try to solicit information questions or, or uh, uh, highlight anything that we may have missed um, so the the background for us going forward with this study uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's all come from the, the downtown stationary specific plan, the climate action plan, the, the climate vulnerability and ad, ad, adaptation report, as well as the multiple Walker report studies we've done over the past few years that showed us um, 
what our occupancy was, uh, what it is currently, and, and considering what we need it for in the future. Um, and then incorporating the different housing units that are coming into Santa Rosa and how that's gonna impact uh, what we currently have uh, when it comes to garages, lots, but also uh, commercial loading zones, uh, ADA spaces, uh, passenger loading zones, and, and everything throughout Santa Rosa. And, uh, and these are a few clips I took out of the, the climate action plan that will show that in, in order to, to uh, reach our climate goals, reduce the GHGs and reduce the VMTs, you know, there's things that we have to do through the climate action plan that are going to help us get to that point, right? In, in conjunction with our changes in order to make things uh, work better in the future for the city of Santa Rosa. Um, a couple of the important items, you know, on, on 3.4, uh, limiting the amount of free parking in high traffic areas. Free parking is going to make people want to drive around and circle and circle. And we want to we want to eliminate circling around too much. Uh, price on street parking relative to congestion. I believe the city did that in 2017 when we pushed forward the the progressive parking policies. Uh, uh, implement the city's residential parking permit program near high traffic areas. This has been going on for years, and we're actively doing it. We, and we have meetings, and this really does help help out a lot of the current residents. Um, and then evaluate the zoning code for amendments to reduce parking requirements where alternative transportation is available or planned. Uh, we've been working really hard on, on developing a really good relationship with transit. Whatever we do, I, I think can affect transit parking wise and whatever transit does, I think can, can help benefit parking. So working together with, with Rachel and her crew, I think it would go a long way. Um, and then of course the uh, goal five, the electric and hybrid vehicles in order to, to make these things work, we need to have the EV infrastructure in place. We need to have the chargers ready to go. And that takes months, if, if not a year plus of planning. So we're, we're gonna work on that as well. Um, some of the intended outcomes for the MTC funded study, um, better utilization of existing spaces, reduce the GHGs and the VMTs, ensure the implementation of EV chargers for public and fleet use, Utilize technology to have a, a real-time data collection so we can be as fluid before this <laughs> van changes. Um, support the city's partnership with pg and &E and Tesla. Install EV chargers in the garages, right? I think that's what we want to do is try to get folks to use the garage more and, and with the lower rates and, and more availability for the EV chargers. Uh, better utilize what we have for the benefit of the businesses and the visitors. Uh, streamline <laughs> operations for improvements. Uh, to aging facilities, better wayfinding and equipment, additional oversight facilities provide a safe and enjoyable experience. Uh, we want people to be able to know where to park before they show up in, in Santa Rosa. We want people to know they can park anywhere and they can be safe. They can visit businesses, they can visit residents, they can come to the, 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 the markets and do anything they want. And so, so we need more outreach and more communication on our end. Uh, community outreach with stakeholders, identify changes, that would benefit all those impacted by parking. Uh, we go out daily downtown and, and I meet with business owners or I meet with uh, 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 guests. Just, I love talking to people. So I'm, I'm down there all the time trying to get feedback from folks. Uh, the only thing I'm trying to figure out uh, as I go forward to make sure I do this, this study correctly and in the right way and I, and I check all the boxes is I find out what do you guys see as a concern regarding parking? Uh, what discussions have you had with guests and business owners of downtown that, that could impact parking? And uh, where do you rank the need to install more EV chargers and infrastructure upgrades along with parking? And uh, there's my contact information if anybody has any questions going forward. And I think we're good. All right, thank you. So before we answer those questions for you and get into a discussion, do you have any questions on the presentation? I have one question, which went back to um, action item 3.4.1, parking on street relative to congestion. Mm -hmm. um, is that, are you looking to bring back some version of progressive parking? I, I, you know, I can't, I don't know what I'm looking for. And I only say that just because I don't know what this study is going to show me as far as where I'm deficient mm -hmm. or, or where I'm in surplus mm -hmm. of. I don't know what's going to happen with the sale of the properties. Uh, I'm not certain on how many developments are coming in. So um, there's going to be holistic changes. I just don't know what they are yet. And um, when you get two hundred seven thousand okay. dollars, does that buy you additional staff time? Does it get you consultants? How does this money get deployed? Um, I mean, I get what the the takeaways are going to be. Uh -huh. I'm just curious uh -huh. how you're going to obtain the deliverables. So uh, this. 
I've been speaking a lot with the MTC. This is a unique situation to where we won't see a dime of that money. The MTC will do the um, uh, the request. They will identify the contractor. They will hire the contractor based on meetings with us and what we need, mm -hmm. and they'll pay everything. They'll they'll have the quantifiables. So we won't have to do anything on on that. We end. don't process any of the monies. No. We just receive that the service. Okay. Yeah. It's unique. It's unique. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Does that mean that they manage the contract also? Correct. Okay. Correct. As far as I um, I understand, and, and uh, we're still in the beginning stages of this, is that when they start identifying multiple vendors uh, and start to make their choices, then we'll be brought into these conversations based on what these people are offering. Okay. So when you do the analysis for downtown, mm -hmm. uh, you have cited in there, uh, I think it was 900 housing units mm -hmm. with 500 and some change mm -hmm. parking spaces. Uh, planned within the, the those developments. Are you planning based on projects that have been proposed or are you planning based on zoning and potential? Proposed. Okay. Proposed and or approved uh, developments right now um, uh, and based on what I can get from from uh, from city. Yeah. Everybody knows that sometimes things will come in, they'll be proposed and then they'll just fall away and, and not be built. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I would encourage you, uh, it's more a comment than a question, but I'd encourage you to also work with Jill Scott our, uh, and, and other folks, Claire, uh, Raisa, because there are, uh, I know of a number of developments that are at least talking to the city mm -hmm. that have not been formally proposed yet. Uh, like for instance, we just finished uh, some of the Surplus Lands Act, some of the first steps of the Surplus and mm -hmm. Lands Act on multiple city owned properties that I know it's not accounted for in that Correct. analysis. Correct. But if we're going to be doing a study, there might be some placeholder numbers that we can put in based on some assumptions so that by the time the study is complete, it's more accurate than it might I be agree. otherwise. I agree. We've had some uh, great conversations. All city staff has been great with Raisa, with Jill, with Claire. Um, I've also had uh, uh, folks like say one Santa Rosa Avenue or um, a different developers who will call me when they haven't even filed for a, an application and they'll say um, if I want to do this right could I get permits here and of course I'll say yeah no problem let's, let's work through this so uh, there's a lot of what ifs that we don't have factual right now that will be a part of this it's going to be six to probably six to eight months is, is how long this study will take yeah, yeah. okay uh, let's go to public comment do we have any hands for public comment on Zoom? We do not. Anybody want to provide comment? Peter, anyone? All right, do you want to put back up the slide with the feedback that'd be helpful from the committee? Do you want to kick it off? Sure, you know, it, it's always interesting to me when it gets to parking, you know, because it's so important. It's one of our greatest assets that we, we don't have more. You know, you'd think that people would be beating down our doors to talk yeah. about parking. Yeah. So uh, what do I see uh, as a concern regarding parking? You know, we want to, you know, it's all about balancing this asset that we have mm -hmm. and making sure that we don't encourage people to not use transit, bike, and pedestrian. We want people to use active transportation. We want to make sure we're funneling as many people into the downtown as possible um, without, you uh, you know, having things being confusing for people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the things you bring up is having the EV. I'm going to bounce around because these yeah, are, do. These are, none of these are really in, distinct. I see that, you know, the idea of having EV charters in the garages is one of the best ways to get people off the street into the garages. Mm -hmm. And it also targets one of the populations that is most challenging to get to use our garages. And so if we can partner, say, with economic development and art and public places to continue to beautify and uh, make the garages lighter, brighter, and uh, feel safer, if there's a great amenity that you cannot be gotten on the street, okay, uh, okay. but can be gotten in the garage, we're going to solve a couple of our problems um, over time in my, in my prediction. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I hear from, from residents who live in these parking districts downtown, particularly Cherry. Yes, um, the residential, yes. Is a uh, significant frustration with the new system of, and, and you and I have been in Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and so I think that, you know, working to uh, figure out a way to incentivize them to have their guests use garages mm -hmm. where there are garages proximal to their residences for, for guest use. Um, 
having some sort of program for limited amount of guest use for them might be a way to ease some of the consternation that they have over yeah. the new system. Um, I'm thinking about uh, a particular around the garage behind Russian River. And then, um, you know, one of the things you, I always think about with parking is, you know, we don't want to dissuade people from coming downtown. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, we don't want to encourage them to use their vehicles. And so what other solutions do we have besides um, charging for parking? I mean, mm-hmm. we, we can charge for parking, but you kind of nailed it on the head about working with transit. Mm-hmm. You know, how can we, we work with transit to make sure that there's less incentives? And I, I'd be interested to have a back and forth with um, the chair about mm-hmm. some of the ideas that as he sees them in order. But the, the number one tool I think is to not place EV chargers on the street. Makes sense. Place them in the garages. Um, but I'm curious to know, I should ask this during the questions period. Have we looked at um, partners outside of uh, Tesla and, and PG&E partners that mm-hmm. might be a little bit more palatable to our public? No, those are great, all great questions. Um, uh, if Let me start first on the EV, the EV question about the garages. Uh, we're actively working on um, getting, fingers crossed, 13 EV chargers starting the process to install 13 EV chargers in garage nine. Um, and if things go well, uh, we could install somewhere upwards of 30 chargers. Is, is nine the one behind Correction River? I'm sorry, uh, this one right here. This one, okay. Yeah. okay. And then garage 12, the one right behind Roxy, we're working on possibly getting 30 plus uh, EV chargers installed in there. So uh, we're definitely focusing on garages with the chargers. Are you focusing on the underutilized garages or the well-utilized garages? In the right place? now, uh, well, I guess, Everything's underutilized right now, um, just because of our occupancy. I know what you mean, but I'm saying I'm hoping that focusing on these that are kind of used to be our good ones, uh, these charges will make them become more utilized and push more people out towards the. When you say used to be the good ones. Is it okay if we when used to be the good ones, like as in they used to be well utilized com- comparison mm-hmm. to the other ones? Nine, I'm sorry, this garage right here used to be uh, have a lot more occupancy with the state and the federal employees downtown, mm-hmm. and they just haven't came back. Mm-hmm. And there's not a big draw for folks to come park in this garage mm-hmm. and then walk downtown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the same with, with um, 12, the one behind the Roxy. The, uh, uh, we used to have more folks. I, I assume they'll come down for the events. Barbie didn't fix that. I know. Yeah. Well, I haven't checked today. I parked Perhaps. there when I saw Barbie. As a matter of fact, we paid a whole dollar for it. Um, but I parked at City Hall. <laughs> and walk over. Smart. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, so, you know, I mean, I think that, and the only time will tell, I think that's really interesting because what you're kind of banking on is that these two types of businesses mm-hmm. that have really not had a good pandemic recovery, mm-hmm. you're banking on luring people back to office and movie theater usage and what we're seeing people come back in droves to is services like restaurants and salons yeah and so you know i would have probably gone if it had been me like Mm -hmm. the garages on the north side of Mm fourth street rather than the south side Mm -hmm. i'm not telling you to change i'm just saying it is an interesting bet and i Mm -hmm. might have split it up between the two Mm -hmm. to see you know for the test to see which side of fourth street got the fastest uptick and return yeah but and also to see which which kinds of economic uses we want to most encourage and and see what rice and her team think you know are most yeah. beneficial to the city to encourage i agree i agree 100 percent. I, I think going forward um i i am assuming that how can i maintain parking if occupancy does not increase i'm, I'm expecting the worst figuring out a way I can kind of continue to go through and still do my job. And then if it improves, then we can spend on other projects. But right now I'm trying to figure out how to maintain. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. The second one, the, the permit thing, maybe offline, you and I can talk. We've made some, um, based on our conversations, some significant changes to that program mm-hmm. uh, that will, will greatly benefit I've been everybody. Uh, complaints lately. So whatever okay. you're doing is, is, is helpful. Okay, good. I think we reached out to them. So that, that's, that's very, very good. Um, and then the third question you were asking as far as, I jumped right past it. The last one. Or did I, did I get them all? You, you might. Oh, partners. Um, uh, I've met with uh, 
Sonoma Clean Power. I've got a pretty good relationship with, with Brand Arthur down there. Um, I've been working a lot with Tesla just because they've got a lot of new things. The changes in, in EV technology is, is going to be a, a universal NACP plug that that even if it's a Tesla charger, uh -huh. it'll it'll be it'll work on on ninety percent of the automobile uh, manufacturers out there, uh -huh. um, um, and, and I, I think that that'll be beneficial. Uh, different city departments, um, you know, uh, Rice's department, Gabe's department, just. I can't do any of this in a bubble, so I've been trying to reach out to everybody, and we're we're all trying to come up with a a, a grand plan on how we can go forward. Uh, the transit, like I mentioned, we've been working a lot with them. We've actually um, introduced a couple months back, but we now we offer a, a, a commuter permit in the lots right under the freeway, a discounted commuter permit because we want people to to use smart. We want people to use transit, and hopefully that commuter permit will encourage more people. Right, and that's an example of a place where I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to putting chargers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I say like, don't put them on the streets, I mean, don't put them in super like valuable parking. Right. Yeah, put them in places where people are less inclined to go. I agree, mm -hmm. I agree. Where they can stay for long, you know, three, four hours if, if they needed to, no issues. Yeah, I mean, just, that's about it. Good points, very good points. Yeah, so on the flip side of that, what I was gonna mention is to me, the amount of electric uh, vehicle charge stations we put in is almost secondary to secondary to what type. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at sort of the demographic of why people are coming downtown, doesn't really make sense for them to leave their car there for three or four hours mm -hmm. to charge on a, a lower level charger. Mm -hmm. But if you had uh, fewer chargers, but more fast chargers mm -hmm. where somebody can plug in and have their car charged by the time they're done having a beer or having a meal. I think that that actually would be a better fit for the economic profile of why people are in downtown. Okay. Um, I actually, I'm glad you brought up the lot for smart because I was going to mention what I think is really uh, key is to decentralize sort of the parking from and make it accessible for all of our public transit mm -hmm. because we do know people are going to drive and park and get on the smart train uh -huh. or drive and if we have the proposed circulator coming back to downtown potentially yeah. uh, like what smart is now doing with the airport mm -hmm. that's an opportunity where you could have people who are pushed towards the outer parking structures and then still take the circulator where they need to yeah. if they're not willing to walk or bike or or do whatever um, so I think looking at sort of those options as well, I'm not ready to, to agree on, let's put the chargers in the garages solely, mm -hmm. but I do like the idea of creating an amenity there for people to be able to come in. And in fact, you know, I, when we have some clean power meetings, for instance, we've got somebody from Cloverdale who drives down for those meetings, drives our electric vehicle and finds a, a charger to plug into every single time. Uh, I know people on the North coast that when they're heading either to Sacramento or to San Francisco for meetings, they intentionally stop in Santa Rosa because of our charging infrastructure is better than some of the places around us. Yeah. And, and I've noticed the same thing for me. I think we were remarking, I drove my, my wife's electric uh, Mini Cooper uh, over to City Hall today. That thing only gets 100 miles on a charge. So when I'm going to Sacramento, yeah. for instance, I'll, every single time I'll stop in uh, Vacaville where they've set up an intentional charging and of course you know while I'm charging even if it's only for 20 minutes half hour on a on a fast charge I'm walking around to those businesses that are there right yeah. and so I think a lot of times with climate and I think charging infrastructure is one of them first movers in the space create their own economic incentive and then it'll diminish over time but we have a really good incentive to create an atmosphere in downtown for people to stop and to charge good point. Um, good point. You mentioned your partnership with Sonoma Clean Power. Sonoma Clean Power's office itself right now is sort of a test case on uh, charging infrastructure. And so talking with them about, there's, a, there's potential to make money off of the charging mm -hmm. um, based on where we place it with businesses and access that we have to businesses. And they're doing a couple of interesting pilot things. Some of it is related to the bi-directional nature that we would need in cars. Some are able, some are not. But having the infrastructure that prepares for that kind of a future, uh, like I know Senator Skinner right now has legislation that would require in the future all electric vehicles to have bi-directional charging huh. where they can both get charged 
by the grid, but then also be used as an essential battery pack in a time of emergency or to sell back to the grid. And so I just want to make sure that we don't install the technology of today. And by the time we get there, there's new technology and new rules. Um, so it might be worth having a conversation with Sonoma Clean Power about what does the next five years look like? What does the next 10 years look like in terms of uh, capacity and, and building? Okay. Um, I, I too, uh, <laughs> between the two of us, we represent every historic district uh, in Santa Rosa uh, and complete around the downtown. Uh, I hear the same things that Victoria is hearing about the residential parking permit program. And it's at a time where people are more interested in it because they're concerned about the impact of housing projects that are nearby. Right. Yeah. So for instance, love the cannery project that's coming in, mm -hmm. but the neighbors on the other side on Pearson right behind it are concerned yes. about the spillover of traffic yes. into their neighborhood, right? Yes. Um, and so I do hear that quite a bit from, from residents. Uh, and then from people who don't live here who are just visiting, they just hate any type of paid parking. Uh, unless they're from yes. San Francisco and then they can those steel. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't think that's helpful to you, but that's that's the no, it, is, it is. It is. Um, sometimes it's just uh, miscommunication. Maybe they don't know it enough or, or what really goes on. So and, and to that point I think that as soon as some other jurisdictions start charging Pittsburgh, Petaluma, Sonoma. Any of them. Yeah. You know charging. somebody in Sonoma you can nudge them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to get involved in that and all of that. So, but if some of our uh, regional partners would start charging for parking, mm -hmm. I think it will make us look less like the bad guys. Yeah. Um, when it comes to that, I think that people just don't get get that we have a parking district. Yeah. So I think you know as much education as is reasonable, uh, and something you know you didn't ask me what I thought, but here we are. Um, five years later. So, um, so one of the things that I, I noticed is that you have someone on your team, a parking enforcement officer, mm -hmm. who I don't know if that's your technical term for those, those workers mm -hmm. who comes in, you know, I'll be at like one of the shops on uh, Fourth Street and Railroad Square mm -hmm. and he'll say, hey, yeah. you know, come check your meters. And I think that those kinds of things build really goodwill. They just build education and an opportunity for people not to feel burned mm -hmm. by, um, you know, overstaying a little bit of, you know, enjoyment time. Yeah. Um, I think that's really helpful. I'd be interested to ask you, Chris, why you think um, what the the logic is about not suggesting putting the EV chargers in the most un, undesirable places near economic opportunities. And I'm not sure I'm against it. Okay. I would need to think about it a little bit more. Um, I'm also a little bit on a, on kind of the, the equity framework because I was driving through the East Bay earlier and I realized how much I hate the paid HOV lanes where like if you're poor, you have to sit in traffic, but if you're not, you don't have to. Uh -huh. And kind of the idea of we're trying to incentivize people to be more climate friendly. Uh -huh. And that means that you're gonna drive a car that's gonna be less polluting and then you're gonna have to park further away and potentially walk than somebody who's driving a car that's polluting and can park right on the square or right on 4th Street because they are not they don't need a charger, right? Okay. I, I'm not saying I hate it, but that's immediately where my head went of the, you're essentially saving the prime parking spots for the non-electric vehicles and pushing the electric vehicles away from those spots. Mm -hmm. Again, not sure I hate it, but that's the first right. thing that it triggered. And I'd the, have to think about right. it And the logic for me is that, you know, if you can afford the electric vehicle and it can afford to charge it, uh, one is that's a demographic that I hear not super willing to come to downtown all the time. Um, so I was trying to think of an incentive to get them to come downtown without giving them the prime parking I, spots. I think we need to move away from the assumption that people who are driving an electric vehicle are more well off. Well, it's just a fact at this point in time. It's not going to be but true forever, it, but it is true now. I disagree that it's a fact now because many electric vehicles are still getting incentives from the state and federal government mm -hmm. that are making them cost competitive with uh, in internal combustion engines. And at the same time, because they have less fuel costs, less mm -hmm. upkeep, it's a it's a first cost barrier. If you can get into one, mm -hmm. it's way cheaper. And mm -hmm. depending on how you get into them, what your loan looks like has absolutely nothing to do with what your economics, uh, your economic is versus somebody else's. Mm -hmm. I'd say in general, you're probably right, but I think we're moving away from that where they're becoming more accessible. There's more on the secondary market. And so I don't wanna make an assumption on a long-term infrastructure plan based on an assumption that 
may or may not be true today, but probably won't be true down well, the road. Yeah, I, don't, I completely agree that it probably won't be true down the road, regardless of what it is now. But I do think that a long-term goal of mine has been to move parking to the garages mm -hmm. and to have higher utilization of them. And, and I agree with that and entirely. I, and so yeah. I think that um, seeing if it makes sense over time, um, you know, I'm not trying to ram it down your throat today, but I'm just okay. curious to know if over time, mm -hmm. adding amenities to the to those garages and not over incentivizing the curbside parking may be something we, we consider. And, and again, you know, I'd have to think more through it, but you can very easily accomplish the same thing by flipping that on your on its head and saying only EV parking in downtown. And then it pushes people who are not driving an electric vehicle into the lots anyway. There, there's ways to, to talk about it if that's what the intended mm -hmm. goal is. Again, not making any dis right. distinctions on it today, but yeah. But there's many lot, a lot of different things to do. I just want to I just want to encourage garage use. Is really yeah. like that I get that. Goal. Yeah. And if if I can, you guys are hitting exactly what's so confusing about EV is that is that how can it be beneficial to everybody and, and then how can we afford it whether you're talking about the city or just parking lot 10 i'm sure you guys saw or maybe not um, <clears throat> we're redoing the lot 10 i'm sorry um the, which one the current uh, lot yeah the one right behind uh, uh russian <laughs> river oh no lot, lot 10 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um right yeah, it just that's one of the things that I'm seven years in and I have still never figured out which lot is which lot unless I'm looking at a map or the one right behind Russian River. We've got this huge project coming up. We're going to redo the entire lot. Um, once all said and done, we're going to have 12 EV chargers in that lot. Right. So as we talk right now about where we want to put the chargers, the big hinge pin for us is when we do this application through PG&E and we wait months to get a response, yeah. we have to give them an exact amount of how much uh, power we're going to need. Right. But as we get to the point where we can afford chargers more, whether we're talking about downtown, if we can put a DC fast charger downtown, like you were saying, as opposed to a level two charger, mm -hmm. well, now people can come downtown shop, get nearly a full charge on their car in 20, 25 minutes, as opposed to using one of the level twos downtown and having to wait three, four hours and then put the level twos maybe in the, in the garages for people who are going to be in the garages for, for hours. So the technology is going to change and costs are going to change. I will say with... Uh, the council member's idea around uh, putting them in the garage. One thing that you could use it as an incentive for is to change people's charging behavior mm -hmm. that for the people who have permits to park while they're at work and park in the garages, if they had a charger that they could plug into, you're actually helping to lower the demand curve because then they're charging during the day yeah. as opposed oh, yeah. to in the evening when energy usage is higher. Mm -hmm. And so you could look at it from a feasibility standpoint of putting those where we have business permits being held. Mm -hmm. And then if you were looking at something on the square or something on 4th Street, the DC fast chargers makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. If you're at work for three or four hours, it makes sense to charge your car, um, so long as it's cost competitive with the rate you'd be paying at home. That's a good point, really good point. Mm -hmm. Cool, two thumbs up. I think it's good. Thank you. My name is Yeah. Okay. Let's go on then to item 5.2. Five point two is the overview of low carbon concrete, and that will be presented by Andrew Pizzell, yes. Meters, a Materials Spe Associate for Transportation and Public Works, and Rob Sprinkle, Deputy Director, Traffic Engineering. And I'll tell you, Victoria's been waiting for this one for a while. She keeps telling me over the last couple of years, "We need concrete solutions. We need concrete solutions." Go. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I, I can be permeable. I mean, flexible. <laughs> ah. Gotta go back, go and, back share. and share. Yes. Just don't Sorry, be hard. Hate. <laughs> See, we've, we've got a we've got a good mix of yeah. jokes here. Yeah. I liked it. <laughs> Skipping. So we have concrete yes. streets on my street and the temperature. Getting so. yeah, there. Literally. Okay. There we go. All right. So thanks for having us today. I'm Rob Sprinkle, Deputy Director of Traffic Engineering, and this is Andrew Cazell. He's our materials associate. He runs our materials lab. Um, our materials lab is um, kind of a gem in Santa Rosa. They do all our compliance testing for concrete, asphalt, um, aggregate, for all of the stuff that goes into our streets, which is one of the reasons why our streets last as long as they do, because we're one of the only agencies that actually um, 
can monitor the quality of the um, the asphalt concrete and aggregate that go into our streets. So it's it's helping our streets last longer than they do. Um, but today we're here just to talk about low carbon concrete. So as we get into that, I'm gonna first um, go over what concrete is in general. So concrete's a mixture of uh, gravel, sand, cement, and water, and it's typically in the proportions of three parts gravel, two parts sand, and one part cement. So, and then the water is what hydrates it and which starts the chemical reaction to harden the concrete um, and, and mixes with the cement. And the cement is the binder and that's what gives concrete its strength. So, um, and the process to make cement, not concrete itself, but just the cement portion of concrete is what is really the GHG hog, I guess, if you want to call it in this instance, and it does produce about 8% of the world's greenhouse gases. So um, as kind of a carbon footprint, one ton of cement creates one ton of CO2. So it's, that's a lot. And that's at the bottom, yeah, it's a ton. So I have a little couple pictures here at the bottom of the uh, slide here just for uh, educational reasons reasons so the the two photos of our trucks on the uh, left those are cement trucks those carry uh, dry product of cement the truck on the right is a concrete truck so that, that's just what so we hear cement trucks a lot and maybe it's just a pet peeve of mine because we work with it all the time but mm -hmm. the cement trucks are the ones on the left <laughs> okay Okay, so what is low carbon concrete? So I'm not going to read the entire definition, but I'm basically just going to summarize it. Low carbon concrete is concrete that uses other products other than cement in it to help offset the cement GHGs. So um, two typical elements that we see around here are slag from blast furnace, um, uh, a byproduct from blast furnace, and um, fly ash, which is from cold fire power plants. Um, so those are both products that can be supplemented in for cement, which then help lower the use of cement, which lowers the, the greenhouse gas. And that's kind of the key to using to what low carbon concrete is. And Andrew can jump in anytime he wants to interrupt me. So feel free to. You're great so far. Okay, good. Um, so then the, in another aspect of, um, so I will read the last part. So potential advancements in carbon reduction in concrete manufacturing are being studied um, in prefabricated concrete construction materials such as pavers, bricks, and center blocks, but it's currently limited to these uh, prefabrication facilities. So on site when they're building those particular items and it's, they're not available yet for doing field ready mix concrete. So that's where they in, like they inject the CO2 to help cure the concrete and use CO2 that way. So they, they're forming the pavers, the bricks, or the center, bun, or center blocks, um, bringing them into the, effectively a curing oven, and then injecting uh, high concentrations of CO2 into the oven to speed up the curing process. Like a soda stream kind of a situation on an industrial scale. Exactly. Just no water in it. It's just pure CO2 in the room. Huh. Yeah. So two examples of projects that we've um, used concrete recently. Um, the one on the left is the um, Fulton Winding project from Gerville to Piner. And then the one that we've finished back in two, uh, yeah, 2019 is the Fulton actually reconstruction project um, between Occidental and West Third Street. So both of those um, projects used a structural section of eight inches um, where we took out eight inches of the existing street section, the structural section of the road and replaced it with um, concrete. So we're using RCC, which is roller compacted concrete on the Fulton widening project on, on the, the one on the left. And we used PCC, which is Portland cement concrete on the project on the right for the, for the project that we've already completed. The differences between those two is the Portland cement concrete is basically concrete you see coming out of a, a truck that's wet. It has, it can flow. It can, you know, it's um, vibrated into place and screed it off. The roller compacted concrete actually is put into a paver. It's very dry and it gets actually compacted with rollers. And you, you can't put a, a roller on wet concrete, it'll build a sink. Like this is so dry that it's actually being compacted um, 
in place with, with steel drum rollers. Mm -hmm. So in the um, Fulton Wagner project, we're using 50% Portland cement and 50% slag in the cementish, cementious, yeah, I can't say that word, material compass, thank you, comp composition. And in the Fulton Road, we used 100% um, Portland cement. So with the mixed designs that we have for both of these um, products, the cylinder strengths or the, the compressive strength of the cylinders were, um, were the same. So you can meet the same strength requirements that we need to meet. But the roller compacted concrete had much less um, CO2 output. So we um, basically we used half as much cement and we saw a reduction of about 46% in the CO2 output. And we used a lot less water. In addition to that, we use a lot less structural section than we would with asphalt. And I'll get into that in a little bit in a couple more slides here. So some of the benefits that we see um, from using concrete roads in general is the carbonation of the pavement or the concrete itself. So um, when concrete undergoes carbonation, it actually captures CO2 from the atmosphere and uses some of that CO2 up that it actually was being produced in the making of the cement portion of that uh, product of the of Portland cement. Also, there's a um, high albedo, which is the um, reflective property of concrete is, is higher. It's about four times higher than that of asphalt. Um, there's other issues with that that can happen where um, Andrew was looking at some studies relating to concrete streets in uh, in Phoenix, and they actually where they had concrete streets and not a lot of street trees. They did see a lot of reflectivity and a lot less temperature on the ground, but that was a, it was reflected back into the buildings, and then the buildings had a lot higher energy use than the buildings that had asphalt streets next to them because mm -hmm. of the reflectivity property of the of the roadway. Um, Concrete streets also provide or offer less maintenance in the future. There, there are higher life um, life cycle costs or higher life cycle than asphalt streets, and I'll get into that in the next slide. And there's less excavation, which means for the same structural section that you get with an asphalt street, you might see, say, a foot and a half of asphalt would do the same amount of structural section or same amount of work for bus loading and truck loading than about eight inches of concrete. So a lot less material, a lot less stress on um, all the natural materials and everything that go into each of the products. So this graph shows um, the life cycle costs on an arterial street with a traffic index of 11. So that's a street similar to Fulton, which has a lot of truck traffic, bus traffic, has bus routes on it, and sees a high volume of traffic uh, throughout the day. The the bottom line is the um, roller compacted concrete or PCC. Those are very similar in the performances. Um, for initial cost at, over at the left at the zero, it's just under $700,000 for um, a per lane mile that's calculated for construction. While the um, two lines that are above it, one is a full depth HMA, which is asphalt. So if you just take the full depth of the structural section and make it asphalt, it's about a foot and a half. Um, that's a little bit under a million dollars. And then if you use actually AB2 as a base, which is the aggregate base rock, and then a smaller section of uh, HMA or asphalt, it's a little bit higher cost. And this, this shows different treatments over the years of the product. So at year eight, you would see for the asphalt, you'd, you would want to do, to maintain it properly, you would want to do a high traffic slurry seal on the product. Then again, in another 10 years or year 18, you'd want to do another slurry and then another 10 years of slurry. And then eventually at year 36, about 35, you'd want to do an actual overlay of that product. So if we move down and that continues over until you have to do a reconstruction in years in the future. If you look down at the um, concrete, there's a much lower maintenance cost, you wait, can wait until year 25 before you do your first diamond grind, which is where you go back and you basically smooth everything out, smooth all the bumps out. And then at year 40, you go back and you replace 10% of the slabs that have cracks or failed or are rocking. And, um, and then at year 60, you would do a 5% slab and then diamond grind again. So this just shows the maintenance costs over the, the life cycle of um, the product and cost savings that you have potentially with uh, concrete over asphalt. Now, now this does vary depending 
dependent on the type of street you would be applying this to. So in a neighborhood street, um, these lines really start out almost identically at the same point. It's, it's almost the exact same cost to do a concrete street as it would be to do an asphalt street. It's just that the maintenance is a lot, is a lot better for the concrete street. But there's other issues that I'm in, concerns with the concrete roads. So um, concrete roads are a, a lot more difficult to cut through for utility maintenance. And then when you have a trench that you have to either repair or say you want a new water service or something, it takes a lot longer to trench and to have the concrete set up and do traffic control for that over, you know, over that trench while you're trying to repair or asphalt, you can typically put down, roll it, and it's ready to go. So there's all there's a time factor there and convenience factor for um, the public. Um, also, this there's difficulty in leak detections and and I mentioned this before, but our local streets don't have the same. Uh, they have about the same initial cost, and then then they do show longer maintenance benefit from that. So with that, I think I talked fast and I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Want to start us off? Yeah, I, I'll admit that my knowledge of material science is somewhat limited. So please forgive me for asking what might seem bonehead questions. Um, when we get to talking about on slide three, fly ash, byproduct from coal-fired power plants, Sounds like a great climate solution. Or steel slag byproduct from steel mill blast furnaces. Uh, walk me through why these options are um, better for the environment. Like, I understand that, that cement takes a lot of, you know, produces a lot of greenhouse gases. Uh, are these products going to be made anyway? And is that why they're better? Or is it just, are we going to count on something that's like terrible to continue to be? produced and we're just needed the byproduct of it. Is that where we're going with this? I'll jump in. Okay, okay I was gonna say I'll go or you can go and yeah. follow. Or... Uh, so fly ash is historically been what we've been using in the city. Um, we have specs dating back to 1982 that's call out for using fly ash. Uh, we've seen fly ash be phased out by many of our producers in our local area because coal power plants are becoming less and less common. Um, with that said, you know, with continued development, both here in the US and we import some slag into the area, um, steel mills will always continue to be a thing. And it's a byproduct, so either way, it's going to be made, and so we might as well throw it in the cement. Right. I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, let's say we have a really dirty steel mill in China, and we're like, hey guys, cool, cool job on making all that nasty like byproduct. Can you ship it over here um, across the ocean in your? also not very efficient freighter. Um, how do we know that the overall, I'm not just talking about like in Santa Rosa, mm -hmm. but the overall effect on the environment is better from using this product? Yeah, so the, from the studies that we can find online, um, these recycled materials cost less even up front uh, CO2 wise to produce than Portland cement. Okay. And I suppose we'll be looking for some better solution than relying on these in the future. Um, yeah, there, I'm sure there will be other things yes. that we are looking. Yes, that will continue to try to reduce the use of cement right. products. Um, the other thing um, around the um, the high albedo is that how you say it? Albedo, yes. Albedo, right. Um, so one of the things that I noticed in areas of Santa Rosa where we do have the concrete streets is that they also are concurrent with uh, mature street trees in a lot of events. Um, I thought that the, the lower temperatures was mostly a result of concrete streets. Um, it sounds like that may not be the case. So I just want to highlight that um, I'm curious if we're starting to think about how to pair um, concrete streets or lighter colored streets with um, more um, incentives around street trees. So that we don't have like a high heat areas, or we we are we do have high heat areas in our in our city, and they do correspond with lower income census tracts. And I just want to uh, be curious about how we're we're looking to mitigate that. So I think that's kind of more of a planning development kind of question because they 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 do the street trees as part of the development process, um, but we could definitely look at you know when we're. So we look at each project, I guess, on its own merit, right. depending on, you know, how, how are we going to use a concrete street or are we going to use asphalt? And, mm -hmm. you know, we basically look at the, 
the best fit that we think for the taxpayers and, and the and the use of that location. Um, so, and we have had locations where we do a slurry and it's a lighter color, like Marlow Road, for example, is a much lighter slurry than we've had than some of the other slurries that have been done. And, and so we do get that reflective property, but we don't always have that choice on the product where it comes from, it's low bid. So right. I'm getting a little bit off track, but, but, I'm, I hear you. but I'm trying to, I hear you. I'm trying to refocus. Some of it's not all on you. But it's but... not, yeah, it's not, it's not always our choice mm -hmm. to, to, it's not always our choice, I guess it's, right. it, so. Yes. So there's a lot of solutions that, that, that we can bring forth that are not within the scope of this here conversation. Yeah. So. Any other questions? All right, let's go to public comment. Any hands on Zoom? No hands on Zoom. Cool. I'll bring it back for, uh, for some discussion then. Uh, so first of all, thank you. Uh, I'd actually be really interested in checking out the lab. I've never uh, actually seen it. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that'd be really cool to, to go and check out how we determine and all of that. Cause I do get asked about that frequently from people about road failures and materials. And uh, so if we could set that up, that'd be great. Uh, I know Marin County passed a low carbon uh, pavement program or preference. Not quite sure how to, how to put it. I'd be really interested to see bring back uh, in the future a discussion about what exactly does that policy look like? Uh, what are the best practices that other jurisdictions are doing? Um, when I was uh, at COP27, they actually had a, an entire area that was dedicated to new materials that were being that were emerging. And many of them that were related to roads uh, kind of fit within this bucket, but saw even greater than that 46% reduction in carbon uh, but also didn't see the same uh, cost savings uh, that, that you potentially get with uh, with concrete. Um, so I would be interested to, to see how do we incentivize uh, the folks who are bidding on our projects to be up on new technologies that might meet both of those goals uh, for us. Uh, I'm actually really encouraged to see, I, one of the big questions I had was about how the upkeep would be, whether materials would fail faster or if you'd have to spend the money on the back end. Uh, and I actually was really encouraged to see sort of your chart there on on maintenance. I think that's pretty incredible, actually. Um, and so uh, doesn't for me doesn't need to be pushing forward with a requirement that we use this type of materials, but maybe looking at it through the lens of how do we make how do we create an incentive for people bidding on our projects to be looking through a climate lens as they do uh, do their bidding and their their worksheets as well. Yeah, we're, we're actually really excited about our our roller compacted concrete project. It's the first in Santa Rosa, and, and not a lot of people are doing it, and it's um, it's turning really out really great. So, first thing I hear from people every time is it sounds different. That when they're driving on it, it sounds different than the asphalt that. Uh, for them, and I, I just always think It'll that's get interesting. It'll quieter too after we diamond grind it, so yeah, it's yeah. probably a little noisy right now. So. Yeah, well, they don't even mean it in a negative way. They just mean it just sounds different than what they're used to. So it's funny how we pick up on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is good stuff. I think it's going to be an interesting um, in the decades to come. This, these technologies are going to get more and more interesting, more complex. I think it's going to be fun and to watch. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, quite frankly, it has to be right. Uh, the built environment, uh, they're expecting a 70% increase in the built environment by 2050, especially as you've got other nations that are building out their infrastructure. And if you have materials that are representing right now 8% of global emissions to hit our climate goals, you can't not touch the built environment. Um, and, and I think we've had plenty of conversations about how do we design the built environment so that people can reduce their carbon impact. but uh, I think Santa Rosa could be a leader in talking about not just how we design it, but what we build it with uh, to be a part of the solution. So, cool. All right, thank you. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right, future agenda items. Let's go ahead and go to public comment and see if anybody in the public has any suggestions for future agenda items that they'd like to see. No hands raised on Zoom. Nope. Anything on your end? 
I'm curious to know if you think that this is, was covered by our last item, our, uh, our last meeting um, around pooling and general like initiatives to actively pool. I know that I'm starting to hear some inquiries, press inquiries around what the city is trying to do to produce a cooling effect and uh, not, not be a heat sink. Mm -hmm. Don't know if you think that that would fall within something that this committee would look at. Nope, I love it. Right. I love that as a discussion, and I know some cities are doing cool roofs and some are doing materials, and to your point about trees, and I think there's a lot of areas that staff can kind of take that um, and bring back some yeah. information for us. Or nothing if not cool. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my colleague does not blow hot air. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Morgan's not coming back. <laughs> But He's like, I'm done. He has. <laughs> well, right. If you want to get With that, we'll adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That was quick. Mm -hmm.